Hello, in this Cool Guard video, we're going to talk about how to face interviews. I'm going to give you a lot of conventional and unconventional advice about do's and don'ts when you're answering interviews. Whether it's a phone interview or an in-person interview, the performance in the interview is what decides whether you get the job or not, regardless of how smart you are, how qualified you are, and how nice a person you are. It's how you present yourself in the interview that makes all the difference, as most of you know. I've seen a lot of really smart people who are not able to land jobs for a long time because of their attitude, the way they presented themselves, or because they were overqualified. And I've seen a lot of um, people who did get through uh, after clearing the interviews, but they were not able to keep their jobs for a long time because of how they interacted with people, or due to corporate politics, or something other than you know what was related to their performance. So I'm going to talk a lot about interview do's and don'ts. First of all, how to dress for interviews. Formals or business casuals. So make sure you're well groomed and presentable because that's what makes the first impression and as they say the first impression is the best impression. Your dress must reflect that you have taken adequate care and put in effort to groom yourself and make a good impression. Presentability is important. It's one of the most important things, not only in an interview, but also when it comes to promotions and customer facing. So even at the level of like the directors and vice presidents, when it comes to promotions, they usually promote a candidate who is more presentable to the public and to the customers, meaning that grooming and dressing is a very important component. So if there's one person who doesn't give a damn about how she is dressed, and uh, doesn't wear basic makeup and who's uh, blunt and rude. And there's another person who is not technically as competent or as business savvy, but if the other person is more presentable, diplomatic and well-dressed and with basic makeup and more presentable, who whom the customers would like more and who could bring in more business, they would promote the other person. It happens a lot of times. Not necessarily all the time, but a lot of times. Presentability is very important. So, looks are looks. It's the way God made you and you can't change that. Looks are looks, but smartness is your choice. And in this competitive world, it's no longer a choice. I mean, you have to present yourself as a smart, dynamic, well-groomed person in order to survive. So, we're going to talk about some dress definitions. Business formal. Business, business casual, smart casual, and casual. So, business formal is what you wear to meetings when you're interfacing with customers and often interviews and career fairs too. It's usually like a blazer and trousers or a skirt for women. Business is, you know, maybe with a tie and some kind of formal clothes, but, you know, nothing casual. But business casual is something less formal than business wear. It could be like a half sleeve t-shirt or something and uh, with no tie, but it's not like, you know, jeans or body wear. So, we're going to take some uh, look at some pictures to decide in which category these de dress definitions fall. So, this is business formal. So, if you're an MBA student, you would require to have at least two sets of business formal clothes. For case competitions, presentations, you have to wear a suit. And... Um, in the university and if you're going to career fairs and for interviews you would be required to dress business formal so please make sure you have a uh, one or two sets of business formal clothes and for men this is an example of business clothes so if you're dealing with a client you know making a presentation you can wear business clothes I mean you don't have to wear a blazer all the time unless it's stipulated so and this is business casual. You know, in some organizations, it really depends on the work culture. Like there was one time I worked for AIG Insurance for just a very brief time. I was interning there and all the men had to wear only like uh, plain shirts with ties every day. So, uh, well, personally, I'm not a big fan of any kind of, you know, formality and rules and regulations. I like a very informal, happily disorganized workplace. But if you want to work there, you have to follow rules and regulations. 
So some people think, you know, wearing a tie is like having a noose around your neck every day. You know, a lot of organizations, these days they don't care. All they care about is getting work done. You know, organizations like Microsoft or Google, you know, I've had friends who work there. So my friend in Microsoft, a really brilliant guy, he would always go to office in like shorts most of the time and t-shirts and, he, you know, he, he didn't, nobody gave a damn. As long as you get the work done, you know, they don't care sometimes. But if you're interacting with customers or the public, of course, you have to present yourself in any organization. So if you work in an organization that emphasizes, you know, how you dress and, you know, formal dressing, then you have to just follow the rules. So this is like business casual. So you see, it's less um, formal than business clothes, but then it's business casual. It's okay to wear this sometimes to office and to meetings and stuff but may not be to client visits. So, smart casual. This is okay, but it's not really office wear. Maybe like Friday or happy hour, it's okay, but depending on the organization culture, it may or may not be appropriate to wear jeans and uh, this kind of stuff to work. Some companies these days, they don't care as long as you do the work. So, But you have to give importance to the company uh, culture. Uh, casual. So this is casual business wear. It's... Um, it's something you wear to university or, you know, uh, to parties and friends and happy hour, but certainly not to work or and certainly definitely not to an interview. So you can't even wear like jeans to an interview because it would make a bad impression. It just reflects some kind of callousness, a kind of indifference which interviewers don't like. For women, this is business formal or you can also wear like a blazer with a skirt. That's also business formal. Business wear, so without the blazer, but like a formal uh, top and, you know, skirt or trousers, that's business wear. Business casual, so this is like less formal than business wear. And um, smart casual, which is, you know, some in some organizations it's okay to wear this to work and sometimes it's not. It's a very casual way of dressing, may not be appropriate for client visits. And casual, that's how you dress when you're partying with friends or hiking or something, but it's not for work. So remember that if you're in some countries where women are expected to dress more modestly, like in Islamic countries, suppose you're making a trip to a Muslim country, then you probably don't want to wear skirts or anything that's above the knee. You might want to wear longer skirts or trousers just so you don't offend the you know, cultural and religious sentiments of the people in that country. Never dress casual to interviews. No jeans or denims. No sweatshirts or sweatpants. No t-shirts. You know, sweatshirts, sweatpants is more like sports clothes, right? Sports attire. And don't wear tennis shoes. Wear anything other than, like, you know, sports shoes. And um, no sports attire. No torn clothes, torn jeans and Turn clothes may be a fashion, but not for an interview. No jazzy, flashy, shiny, crazy outfits, you know. If you have got your hair dyed green color and with piercings all over and, um, you know, wearing all kinds of uh, funky belts and stuff, well, it, the interviewers might think that you might not be so serious about life and about your job. And it's all about impressions, you know, ultimately, it's how they perceive you. Even if you're wearing formal clothes, if you've got piercings all over and crazy hairstyles and the, you know, crazy kind of um, watches and crazy stuff, then it may reflect poorly on you and you might be diminishing your chances. Women's dressing tips. No mini skirts or revealing outfits. So, don't try and, you know, use your body and show off your assets to, you know, land a job. That's probably not going to work in most cases and it's a very cheap way of getting it. So try and be modest and no low neck t-shirts or tops. As I said, be modest, no cleavage. So make sure you're dressed modestly, covering the parts of the body that are meant to be covered well. No transparent clothes. Some women don't realize it. Their clothes are so transparent and all the inner wear is seen through and they don't realize it. Please, no transparent clothes. No off-sleeve or shoulderless tops. So, um, make sure you wear something 
that's modest. No capris. Capris are not considered formal wear and it's not even like business or business casual. Avoid wearing capris to an interview. It's your one chance to make an impression and don't blow it. No bare midriff or low rise jeans. So a lot of people wear low rise jeans and you know when they sit and bed and, and even walking it's like you know their midriff is shown. It makes a bad impression on the interview panel. No thongs, so dress modestly. Dressing do's and don'ts. So for women, if you're wearing a skirt, so wax or shave your arms and legs. So it's an unwritten rule of etiquette. If you can't even take the trouble to shave your legs and if you're presenting yourself that way, it makes a very poor impression about, reflects on your poor judgment about dressing and presenting yourself. And it, well, ideally nobody should deny you a job for that, but these are unwritten rules of etiquette and they could suddenly hold it against you and you could diminish your chances. So, if your legs are not waxed or shaved, you can wear pantyhose. And if you wear pantyhose, make sure it goes all the way to the thighs and not up to the knees. So, uh, wear closed shoes with formal suits, skirt or pantsuit. So, when you're wearing a blazer and formal clothes, make sure you wear closed shoes. That's how you dress. There was one time I was wearing some kind of um, slippers with uh, a little bit open in the front and one of my um, um, staff members in the MBA program called me and told me that, you know, you've got to wear closed shoes. That's not the way you dress. So, when you're in India or Islamic countries, respect the sentiments of the people and wear longer skirts and longer clothes to be more modest. Avoid too much makeup. So, it's important to wear the minimal amount of makeup but not flashy, jazzy eyeshadows and makeup and, you know, like black color lipstick or something or black color nail polish which makes you look like a vampire or looks, look crazy. Wear just basic makeup. So, let's talk about what to say and what not to say in an interview. So, do your homework first. Research the company and position well. Do your homework and gather lots of information about the company you're applying to, their products and services, their website, and what they have been in the news for lately. So, so if the company has had a major breakthrough recently they launched a very interesting project that a project or a product that was very famous they were in the news because their ceo made some um, speeches recently and they got some award or they inter opened a new branch in china or maybe because they started a new corporate social responsibility venture in india whatever the company has done you got to be aware of it when you go to the interview so most of the information will be on the website and then in the news. So, research the company well enough. Try and understand what their pain points are, what their products are, what they're doing and talk about it and say, hey, I read about this in the news and I think that's amazing and I would like to work for your company. That demonstrate, You need to demonstrate a genuine passion and interest in the company and that you really want this job. Talk positive. So be cheerful, enthusiastic, happy, smiling, and positive. Radiate friendliness and warmth. Even if you've had a bad day, even if you have family problems, you're in a depression, whatever. It's, well, it's almost like putting on a show. Be positive, be radiant, enthusiastic, and you boost your chances of getting the job. Talk about even the bad experiences that you've had in life as a good learning experience, if you have to. Don't keep whining about them. Convince the interview panel that you can handle stressful situations with ease, calmness and composure. You don't have to be, you know, overacting or, you know, hyperactive, but demonstrate enthusiasm. But it's also important to be calm and composed because if there's a lot of stressful situations and if you're the kind of person who's going to blow up or who's going to, you know, fall into depression or something, you don't want to be in that kind of a situation. Portray yourself as a dynamic leader who can motivate and inspire people and get work done efficiently. So whether you're an individual contributor or a team lead or a project manager or a vice president, it's important to get along with people in the organization. And I've seen a lot of people who were let go simply because they couldn't fit in the organization culture. 
So, portray yourself as someone who's dynamic, who gets things done, and who also gets along with people. Don't be a complainer. So, nobody likes whiners and complainers. So if you're going to be talking about bad things in your previous job and your family problems and, you know, how you don't like the winters because it's so cold, you're waiting for the summers, that just reflects on your personality as a whiner and a complainer and nobody likes complainers. If you want to talk about some unpleasant events or a problem, mention it in a positive way as a good learning experience. When you report issues to your manager or boss, don't just mention the nature of the issue. Suggest three approaches to solve the problem. So that's what I always do. When I report problems to my managers or my CEO or the executive management, I don't tell them, hey, this is the big problem we have. Nobody likes to hear that. I tell them, so these are the three options by which we could try and resolve the problem. If you do this, these are the pros and cons. And if you use this approach, these are the pros and cons. And if you try to solve the problem in this way, these are the pros and cons. So what do you want to do? So they might either pick one of the three or they might pick some other way of solving the problem. So be a proactive problem solver and not just a complainer. Don't badmouth previous jobs, employers or colleagues. Always talk well of your previous employers, bosses and colleagues. So, um, so if you're going to badmouth your previous employers, it's almost certain you won't get this job because then this future employer is probably going to think that after you leave this company, you're going to be badmouthing them anyway. So don't badmouth anyone. Don't say negative things about your previous companies. Even if they were doing something really bad and even if you got fired unjustly or even if your boss was a horrible person, you shouldn't be talking about how bad they were in the interview in your next job. Not for anyone else's sake, but for your own sake, because you want this job. So, if the interviewers ask you as to why you left your previous job, say something in a positive tone, such as, you wanted more challenge and the new job might provide better opportunities for career growth. You can say, that company was not doing very well and I thought, your company provides me the best opportunity to boost my career. I wanted to... I think you, this company provides me an opportunity to you know, utilize my skill set better and there's more challenge and I like the vibrant atmosphere in this company and um, I wanted a change and um, it might be okay to say the company was facing severe financial problems and uh, there was job instability so you thought you'd buy, find a better job. You don't have to let them know they've let you go or you got fired you know, unless it's absolutely necessary and they already know or something. You can say the situation was bad and I'm looking for another job or you can say the project ended and uh, I, I wanted to move on, I wanted more challenge, I wanted to grow, I wanted a change, I wanted to try something new, so you can talk about that, it's perfectly okay. Don't interrupt your interviewers. Be a good listener. Listening skills are as important as communication skills. Sometimes it's just important to shut up and listen in a meeting, in an interview, wherever. Don't interrupt interviewers or cut their sentences short. So some people, they're hyperactive, they're oversmart, they just keep interrupting the interviewers. They don't even let them finish their sentences, whether it's on a phone interview or a, an in-person interview. So if you're completing the sentences for your interviewers, what does it reflect? It probably implies that you're trying to, you think you're smarter than the interviewer and you think the interviewer is not smart enough to complete his sentences on his own so you're doing it for him. It reflects impatience. You don't have the patience to wait for him to complete his sentences. And it reflects rashness and a kind of arrogance which is that you don't kind of respect the person enough to let him complete his sentences. You think, hey, I'm smarter, I can do this for him. It reflects on your attitude and personality. So don't interrupt people. Wait for them to finish their sentences. Learn to genuinely respect people from the bottom of your heart. If you just pretend to respect people, so try and develop sincere patience and respect for people. Don't argue with interviewers. 
Interviewers care not only about what you say, but also about how you say it. Your tone must not be challenging or aggressive. It's okay to be assertive, but not aggressive. Be cordial and pleasant. So, it's important to gel well with people, regardless how smart you are. If you can't get along with people, if you don't genuinely respect people, then you're probably not going to get the job. Learn to disagree in an agreeable way. If they ask you a question and you answer, and they say, this is not what I want, it's okay to disagree, but in an agreeable way. Be assertive, but not aggressive. Portray yourself as a good team player, and that's a mandatory skill for survival. Because you can't work all by yourself, it's about the organization culture. Don't give TMI. TMI means too much information. Answer to the point and provide only relevant details. So, whatever information you're giving, think about whether it is going to work in your favor or against you. Don't give unnecessary information as it might work against you. Talk about your skill set and experience only relevant to the position you're applying to. So, I mean, don't give unnecessary information. And talk only about your interest in this particular role that you're applying to. If you're applying for a business analyst position, don't mention that you're equally good at QA, quality assurance, or project management, and you want to scale up to be anything other than in the business analysis field. So this is something I learned the hard way. So uh, there's sometimes like I was applying uh, many years back for a business analyst, business analyst position and I told them in a couple of years I think I'd want to scale up to be a senior business analyst and then a year later I want to be a project manager and then get on to management. So I didn't get the job. So if they think you have interest in some other field or if your interest lies elsewhere, they're not going to like give you this job. If you're applying for a QA, QA job, you have to tell them you want to be a QA and nothing but a QA. You have to demonstrate conviction in your interest. It happened to me again, you know, when I applied for a Scrum Master job a couple of years ago. Um, a Scrum Master is like an Agile project manager, you know, in Agile teams. So... I told them, you know what, I'm equally good at project management. So in my previous projects, I've managed the budget, I've managed the stakeholders, I've managed, uh, you know, I've prepared project plans and business plans. And, uh, I've, you know, the, in my previous project, the QA manager was not competent. So I stepped up and I did the QA. I gave out the QA best practices and I also laid out the change management process and um, I did all this other work so I can do this too. I thought I was portraying myself as a really smart person, but it actually backfired. It works against you. Because if they hire you to be a scrum master, they expect you to do the scrum master job and nothing more than that, unless they ask you to. If you say, I want to do project management, I want to do QA, I want to do business analysis, while being a scrum master, then you're probably going to step on other people's toes and they don't want that. And a lot of people have been fired, in fact, like, you know, there was one scrum master who was working on the project management job and also doing the QA testing. And the other people were getting annoyed because she was doing their job. So candidates have been rejected simply because they wanted to scale up to be some, in some other role. If they hire you to be a developer, they would expect you to be a developer for a while and then a senior developer and then a tech lead and then switch over to something else. You can't talk about your interest to be a business analyst after a while you're going for a developer's job talk about your interest in programming and development and all that a developer does and nothing more than that so don't tell them your interest lies elsewhere okay ask relevant good questions so what the ask the interviewers good and relevant questions such as what are the day-to-day -day responsibilities of the job so what would I be doing all day I mean do you handling this and this and this? What would I be doing? Tell me about the organization culture. Is it more idea, task, or people-oriented? So in an idea-oriented environment, we talk all about innovation and ideas. And um, idea comes first. People are secondary or tertiary. Task-oriented environment, we care about getting things done. They don't care so much about ideas or people. In a people-oriented organization, it's all about people satisfaction giving them enough uh, 
work-life balance and letting them take time off periodically and keeping people happy. People are not happy, the organization won't uh, retain the person who is causing them to be unhappy. You have to tune yourself to fit into the organization culture. So if you go to a people-oriented organization and all you care about is getting things done, you don't care about hurting people's sentiments, then you're not going to survive there. But if you're in a task or idea-oriented environment, like if you were working for Steve Jobs, he cared about getting things done. He didn't really care too much about people, I guess. So in that environment, you would probably survive if you're more task-oriented. So you have to fit yourself into the organization culture. What are some of the current issues you're facing in the organization? So this is a good question to ask in an interview. Ask them, what are your current problems and how can I help you to solve them? And you can tell them, I've seen this happen before and I've stepped up and helped solve such problems. So that would definitely work in your favor. Prepare for a phone interview. So if you're going to have a phone interview, so most companies, they usually have a first round of phone interview and then followed by a Skype or WebEx or an in-person interview. So if you're, doing, if you're going to answer a phone interview, how to prepare for that? So compile a list of your strengths and weaknesses and review the typical phone, re phone interview questions that I'm going to talk about next. So you want to be prepared but sound natural and not rehearsed. Plan on being prepared for a conversation about your background and skills. So, I've noticed that in India, people ask more generic questions, like, tell, tell me about yourself, tell me about your family, your previous job, you know, it's more generic. But in the U.S., they, ask, they give you a specific situation and help you, ask you to analyze it and answer specific questions. So, it's very kind of different from answering interviews in India. Tips for phone interview. Keep your resume in a clear view. So if you're having a phone interview, keep your resume in front of you so you can talk about when you worked in different clients and how you, at what duration you worked on different companies and projects. So uh, you need to have your resume handy. Have a short list of your accomplishments available to review. Have a pen and paper handy for note taking. So if they if they make some comments that you want to note down, have a pen and paper ready. And turn call waiting off so your call isn't interrupted. If the time isn't convenient, ask if you could talk at another time and suggest some alternatives. For whatever reason, if you can't inter answer the phone interview at that time, ask if they can call you at some other time. So keep the room quiet. Get the kids out of the room and the pets. Turn off the stereo and the TV. Close the door. So make sure it's a noise-free environment. So make sure your cell phone service is going to be good and you get a clear signal or consider using a landline and to avoid a dropped call. And it's good to, like if you're calling the interview, usually they call you and tell them sometimes that if the cell phone uh, signal drops, then you can call me on this alternate number. Or um, if you make sure your battery is charged. So if it's a long interview, make sure you have enough battery. And it's not good to talk on the cell phone while it's being charged because that's dangerous. Practice interviewing. Talking on the phone isn't as easy as it seems. It's good to practice. So have a friend or a family member conduct a mock interview and tape record it to see how you sound over the phone. Any cassette recorder will work. You'll be able to hear your ums and ahs and okays and then you can, you know, improvise on them. So, rehearse answers to the typical questions you'll be asked. During the phone interview, don't smoke, chew gum, eat or drink. Because the other person can know you're eating or drinking or chewing gum. Somehow they know, believe me. So, keep a glass of water handy in case you need to wet your mouth or you start coughing. Smile. Smiling will project a positive image to the listener and will change the tone of your voice. So even if you're on the phone, if you're smiling, it changes the tone of your voice and up makes you appear more cordial and friendly. Speak slowly and enunciate clearly. Use the person's title, Mr. or Miss or their last name. Use only a first name if they ask you to. 
so in any country, so if you're addressing me, like my name is Vinaya Kurpar, so you'll address me as Miss Kurpar. And you usually address them as Mr. Somebody, Miss Somebody by last name, unless they ask you to use the first name. Don't interrupt the interviewer and give short answers. Answer to the point. You don't have to talk too much. And some people keep talking on and on and on and the interviewer gets fed up. And don't talk too loud. It can turn them off. Take your time. It's perfectly acceptable to take a moment or two to collect your thoughts. Tell them, I'm, I need a moment to think and think before you talk. It's okay. Remember your goal is to set up a face-to-face -face interview. So after the phone interview, ask them, so what... Well, what are the next steps? When can I expect results of this interview? What can we do to expedite it? How can I follow up? It's always good to ask. And your goal is to set up a face-to-face -face interview. After you thank the interviewer, ask if it would be possible to meet in person. After the interview, so take notes about what you were asked and how you answered. Remember today, thank you. Thank them profusely. Follow up with the thank you note, which reiterates your interest in the job. Don't harass future employers by calling them too often, asking about interview results or start date. So there was one time I had a classmate and she was offered a job after her MBA and she kept calling these future employers every day. She already had the job offer. She kept calling them every day saying, when is my start date? When can I come? Hey, I got a start. She kept harassing them. And guess what? They canceled the job offer even before she could start. This can happen too. It's that serious. Don't annoy people, okay? So, typical phone interview questions. So, they're going to ask you about your background. Which company did you work for? What was your job title, job description, dates of employment? What were your starting and final levels of compensation? They ask you sometimes. What were your responsibilities? What did you do day to day? How did you scale up? How did you interact with people? Uh, what were the different things you did? What major challenges and problems did you face? How did you handle them? So this is a common question. So you can talk about how you solved interpersonal problems or how you uh, resolved a technical problem or how you uh, in prepared a new design. You can talk about those things. Why are you leaving your job? Don't bitch about your previous employers. Don't say bad things about them. So. Always say, I'm looking for better opportunities, for better growth, more challenge, and something new. And I think your company is an exciting place to work in. Put it that way. What are your salary expectations? So, you, the candidate, must never bring up the salary question. You can't tell them, hey, how much are you going to pay me? What is the salary? It's very, very rude to say that. And they should bring up what are your expectations, and then you talk about what you were making previously and what you're expecting. Questions about your new job and company. About the new job and the company. So, what interests you about this job? And why are you taking up this job? Why do you want this job? What applicable attributes or experiences do you have? What interests you? Why do you want this job? So, why this job and why not some other job? You have to convince them that this is really the job you want. What experiences do you have? What can you bring to the table? How can you bring profit for the company? You don't have, I overqualified for this job. So if you tell them, you know, too much, then they probably won't give you the job. It's happened to me sometimes. Like a few years back when I was interviewing for a scrum master position, they, I asked them, what are your problems in your organization? They, tell, they told me they didn't know how to make the sprint plans, the project plans, to uh, determine the timeline and what, can, what work can be done in parallel. So I explained to them how exactly to do that. You know, the timeline estimation, workload estimation, resource estimation. I told them the entire, I gave out the entire process. We interview was scheduled for half an hour. It went on for two hours. They were so impressed. I gave them the entire procedure to lay out the sprint plans and, you know, do research timeline uh, estimation. And that's all like a program manager's job, okay? So above the Scrum Master, there's a project manager, above whom there's like usually a program manager. And I was talking very competently about the program manager's job. They thought I was too smart for a scrum master's job. They're like, hey, she can do all this. She's so smart. Then why does she want to be a scrum master? So they actually rejected me. They said, very strong candidate, but doesn't fit in our organization culture. What they're trying to say is she's too smart for this job. And 
you know, they probably thought if she, if I get on board that I'm going to make them look stupid. Or maybe they thought I'm smarter than their program manager and they didn't want that to happen. So they actually rejected me. It happened once. So remember, your job is not to make them feel insecure or stupid. You have to let them know I'm here to help you succeed. I'm here to help your project succeed. You're not going there to outsmart them and make them feel stupid. That's like the stupidest thing you can do. You're supposed to make them feel great and also make them respect you and want you on the team. So what challenges are you looking for in a position? Technically, functionally, in what, what are you exactly looking for? What can you co come to the company? Are you willing to travel? So some people outright say they're not ready to travel. And some people say I can do minimal travel, 10%, 20%, whatever. And it's always good to say, yes, I can do some minimal amount of travel. Don't tell them outright, no, I have family commitments, I cannot travel. Tell them, you know, once in a while I can travel a little bit, but not on long-term assignments. So you don't have a lie, be honest, but if you say, no, no travel at all, then you're probably diminishing your chances. Questions about you. So, what are you looking for in your next job? Why is this important to you? What are your greatest weaknesses? So this is a tricky question. So when you talk about weaknesses, so you talk about um, what are your greatest weaknesses? It's like, you know, you can portray a weakness also as a strength. Like you can say, for example, a safe answer would be, I'm not very good at delegating work. So um, when I delegate work to somebody else, I sometimes feel that person is not probably going to do it and that person may not do it the way I expect them to do it. So what do I do? I step up and help them and sometimes I finish the work by myself. I take it on my own plate and finish it. So that reflects that you're a problem solver. So you can say, I need to learn how to delegate tasks to others and trust people more. So it's a kind of safe way of answering this question. It reflects that you genuinely want to uh, you know, improve your interpersonal skills and people skills and work and, as a team player. And it also reflects that you're ready to take on the slack. If the other person is not doing it, you step up and do it and solve the situation, the problem. So that's kind of a safe thing to say. About your weaknesses, if you say, people, you know, I can't get along with people, that's my biggest weakness. Oh, then you're probably not going to get the job. Nobody likes to hear that. So talk about your weaknesses also as a strength. Talk about your greatest strength. So whether it's about people or technology, whatever is your greatest strength, being proactive, talk about it. Describe a typical work week. Tell them your job is your first priority and your day is not done till the job is done. So talk about your dedication. How do you describe the pace at which you work? Tell them you're efficient, smart, and you tune yourself to the organization culture. How do you handle stress and pressure? Probably you could tell them you do a lot of yoga and meditation and you rarely ever blow your fuse and you've handled very stressful situations with calmness and composure. What motivates you? You have to portray yourself as self-motivated. Don't tell me it's the money that motivates you. And don't tell them, you know, I need to be prodded every now and then. Instead of saying, I'm dynamic, I do my things and I also step up and help other people. That's what they like to hear. Questions about your career goals. So it's okay to say, uh, you know, I haven't really thought about it or, you know, I might want to be in this role for a while and then scale up to get into the management side or improve my technical skills. So talk about that. What kind of work environment do you prefer? Where there's a lot of collaboration, people, and uh, freedom to work, work-life balance. These are general things you talk about. Don't tell them you want to be left alone. You know, that's not a good thing to say. How do you evaluate success? When you've really made a difference, done your best, you can say something like that. So mistakes and fake resumes. A lot of people fake their resumes and put skill sets and experience that they really don't have. First of all, it's not good to do that. And if a company finds out, you can be blacklisted. So in fake resumes, even if you're faking it, you've got to be sensible. Like I've seen cases where some candidates like... Um, in 2012, he had put in 10 years of Android development experience in his resume. So he started working on Android even before Android was invented. What a genius. So some uh, 
scum masters i've seen their resumes they started they were scum masters for like uh, 14 years in the year 2012 so even before the ajay manifesto was released they became scum masters so that makes them look stupid right be very careful about such things some candidates say they worked in a particular city for a few months or years so they say i worked in boston on this project in the us and i was here and suppose the interviewer is also from boston they say oh where did you live they don't know which part of boston and they don't know which apartment they like oh have you been to that place there in boston they like uh, i don't know and some people they didn't even know that mit and harvard are universities located close by and they, that means they didn't ever live in boston it was obvious to the interviewer so if you say you've lived in a particular place you better do your research think about the you know what places are there to see in that city and you know some apartments whatever you, if you're faking it at least you should fake it well and it's better not to fake it at all so be very careful about these things you don't want to get caught so some sample tough interview questions um there's this link gaurikumar.com/interview i just found it on the internet and i think it's a good source of some tough interview questions look at the manager's perspective putting yourself in the mindset of the manager in relation to interview questions so put yourself in the manager's shoes and think what the manager really wants imperative to come up with interview questions that dig deep into a potential hire's passion drive commitment and problem solving skills so don't just focus on the job responsibility and skill sets whether he's technically qualified it's also about the personality his drive whether he has a high get it factor whether he's coachable whether he's willing to learn these things matter whether he's a team player is a very important question so even if a person is really intelligent brilliant if he is not self motivated or if he's not a good team player it's not going to work out what initially picked you interest in this job so most companies are going to ask you this in an interview why did you get interested in this job so if the answer is detailed it reveals he has done his research on your company and the role and he's a good fit if you're like sitting and blinking or you tell them you know i'm i don't mind any job i'm not particularly interested in this job alone if i get it i'll take it any other job i'll be equally interested that's not a good answer so talk about this company its growth prospects how it's cool to work here you like the work culture and um, you've had you people your friends were working there before and they said a lot of nasty a lot of really nice things about this company so say good things and do your research about the company so don't portray yourself as desperate to get any job so even if you've been out of work for 3 months and you desperately need a job don't show desperation it's going to backfire but when it comes to job interviews or dating or marriage or anything if one person starts showing desperation the other person is going to back out so keep that in mind have you visited our website what intrigued you about it so always visit the company's website and know about their company and products before you go for an interview if the candidate couldn't even bother to pull up the website and do his research then chances are he is not truly interested or detail oriented or well prepared when your work day was over but tasks weren't finished so this is a common question that interviewers ask so it's already 5 o'clock the day is over and your work is not completed your tasks are not over what do you do a media candidate would say i'll put it off to the next day or i'll you know I try and do what i can for another half an hour and then i'm going to call it quits but a good candidate someone who cares about the company would say you know my day is not done till the work is done so i take it home and work sometimes or i try to uh work early the next morning and you know i somehow make sure the deliverables are met so that's what the company likes to hear tell them what they like to hear so they don't want someone who loses focus and skirts off at the very first opportunity so how do you pick up slack if a coworker doesn't finish a task so this is to know your level of commitment and how you get along with team so a mediocre person would say you know i'll let the person do it the next day or guide him and micromanage him and let him do whatever he is supposed to do a great employee would take ownership of the task and do it himself they want proactive problem solvers so they also give you a lot of aptitude test questions so 
they might give you an actual problem, situation that the company is facing and ask you how will you solve it. And so they want to know how you can actually be an asset to the company. So remember, an interview is a 360 degree assessment. It's your technical skills, your presentability, how you get along with people, and uh, your previous experience, and it's everything about you. So it's not just, even if you're a nice person, if you're so tired and you don't do well in the interview, you're done for. So what not to say in an interview? Don't reveal your health problems to your future employer unless absolutely necessary. If they're doing a background check or if they're asking you in the health checkup, then of course you have to reveal it if it's mandatory. But on your own, you don't have to tell them your health problems. Life is unfair. People hate you where it hurts. It happened to a friend of mine. She was working for a company and she... Um, I told them in the health checkup very sincerely that she was suffering from depression and taking antidepressants. And when she got on board, they're not supposed to do this, but they treated her like trash. They treated her like she had some horrible disease. And in the depression, they're like, you know, are you competent to do this job? Are you really uh, capable of doing this job? Are you physically fit to do this job, mentally fit? They kept harassing her. And they didn't even give her any work for two or three months. And then, even when they did give her a job, they gave her a kind of a trial, small kind of job to see if she's good enough to do it. And she, there, she was sitting there for three months without doing any work. She was bored. And one time she was like, you know, napping in the office. You know, they had blocked all the emails and, you know, they could, all the internet sites. You couldn't browse the net. You couldn't talk to your, anyone in the, uh, talk to your friends. You couldn't play chess. You couldn't walk around. You just had to sit there from morning till evening. And the friend was so bored. Anybody would get bored if you make them sit in one place from morning till evening without doing any work. Can't these stupid HR managers understand it? So she was sitting there and sometimes once or twice she was caught napping and the, you know, you have to get a physical fitness certificate from your doctor, psychiatrist, that you're physically fit to work. Stupid! If you don't give someone work to do for three months and the person is sitting there bored, anybody's going to feel sleepy. Don't they know that? Just because she mentioned in the health checkup that she was suffering from depression, they treated her like trash. Made her feel like she's not physically, mentally fit to do the job. The job was so easy. And finally, uh, due to conflicts, whatever, uh, she, she was let go after about three or four months. So think about revealing your shortcomings and health problems. If you have a weak spot, the world hits you where it hurts. That's the way it works in the practical world. In theory, they're not supposed to hold it against you. But in practice, it has happened to a lot of people. So, and uh, if they ask you if you can work overtime, always say, yes, I can do overtime. That's not a problem. And you can do a little bit of overtime. And after you get the job, you can negotiate on the overtime part a little bit. But in the beginning, if you say, you know, I have a baby at home. It happened to one of my friends. So she was a really competent quality assurance analyst. And she taught me a lot of QA work. Very smart girl. And when she was pregnant, she went to so many job interviews and nobody ever gave her a job. Because it's obvious she was heavily pregnant and they would think, oh, in a few months she's going to go on maternity leave and then I have to again look for a replacement. She wasn't able to get a job. And a lot of bachelors, guys who are much younger, inexperienced, stupid, they got the jobs. Life is unfair. Learn to deal with it. And after she had a baby, she so I would genuinely tell people in the interviews, like, they would ask her, can you do overtime? And she would tell them, Sincerely, that she had a baby at home to take care of, so she had to go home by 6 o'clock. And she was not able to get a job for more than like 7 or 8 months during her late pregnancy. And then after she had the baby, she, nobody would give her a job for almost more than a year, actually. So whatever your family problems are, whatever, if they ask you, can you do overtime, your safest bet is to say, yes, I can do a little bit of overtime, not a problem, we can work on that. We can adjust our schedules or something like that. We can adjust our schedules once in a while. And after you get on board, you can negotiate it a little bit. You can do a little bit of overtime here and there. I mean, so, but if you tell them outright, I can't do overtime, don't be surprised if they reject you and you're diminishing your chances, believe me. That's the way the world works. Don't act over smart. So interview... You try to outsmart the interviewers, you tell them how to run their company, 
they're not going to give you the job. First of all, when the new hire comes on board, they want someone who's going to shut up and follow rules and try and adjust himself and fit into the organization culture. Don't make them feel you're overqualified for the job. Don't make them in any way feel that you'll be a troublemaker. They don't want people who will expose the stupidity of some of the team members. If you're the kind of people who's going to go there and make others feel stupid and insecure, they don't, they're not going to hire you. You have to convince them that you're going to help them succeed. So, don't let them know you have other career plans such as after a couple of years you want to do a PhD, then, you know, when they're hiring you for a job, they would expect you to stick on and work there for quite some time. They don't want someone who has other plans. Like after a year you're planning to, you know, um, go off to the Himalayas or, you know, uh, you know, do a PhD or something, then they're probably not going to hire you. Tell them you want nothing but the job and you really want the job, you're going to do a good job at that particular job. That's all you talk about. Everything else is secondary. This brings us to the end of this video about how to face interviews and what to say, what not to say. I've given you a lot of conventional and unconventional advice. So I hope this helps you fare better in interviews. Life is unfair, learn to deal with it. And it's a very complex maze of, you know, human emotions, psychology, perception, who likes you, who doesn't like you. In the corporate world, the person who scales to the top is not necessarily the most intelligent one or the brightest one. It's usually the person whom most people want up there. It's the person who can get along with people, who can navigate this complex maze of relationships, who can position himself in such a way that he is not perceived as a threat by a lot of other people, who doesn't make other people feel stupid and insecure, who really knows how to, you know, navigate his strategy and get to the top. He's not necessarily the most intelligent person who makes it to the top. That's the way the corporate world works and you better learn to deal with it. It's not only the corporate world, in it, anywhere. I mean, unless it's like academia, it's slightly different. If, you pub, you know, if you're publishing a really good research paper, they judge it on its merit. But even in the academic world, there is politics. And academic politics is only like one notch above corporate politics. So wherever you are, you have to learn to gel with the organization culture and learn to get along with people and learn not to be a troublemaker and don't make other people hate you or feel insecure around you. This is a very important survival skill. So, I've seen people, you know, who are really brilliant. They've answered like, you know, sometime, uh, a few years ago, Google used to have like 17 rounds of interview for hiring master's students. I mean, after their master's degree. And I've known really nice people who cleared 11 rounds, 16 rounds, and then they were let go for whatever reason. It's so complex. You can't predict the outcome. And if you get rejected, don't get disheartened. Have a plan B, but you don't have to tell the interviewers about your plan B. So, good luck in answering interviews, and I hope this helps.